Everyone, good afternoon, good evening, good morning from the chat and from the familiar names that I see, as well as the discussion about people's locations. I can see that we have folks from a wide range of destinations. That it is exciting to welcome you here with us to a session on applied AI in healthcare challenges and opportunities. We are grateful to have this collaboration between HBS Healthcare Alumni Association, of which I'm a representative, uh, the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health, and also the Harvard Chan School Alumni Association. To begin this session, I uh, will run us through some of the logistics. We invite you folks to submit questions to our speakers as the session progresses, and you can do that by adding your questions to the Q&A box. As uh, you may have noticed, the session is being recorded. So if you submit a question, there is a good chance that if your question is used in the session, that uh, you will be called out, your name will be named. So please be cognizant of that. Once again, it is a joint program between our alumni associations and Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. And uh, I am grateful to our collaboration, grateful to the schools, grateful to my colleagues, Joe Montrose, Grady Close, to Trish and Panch, and all our outstanding panelists, David Rogers and the team from Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, this program is a, a record number of attendees that we're seeing here, both in the program and a number of people that are still supposed to join us. Uh, obviously an exciting topic, and uh, we're conducting this program with an eye to future further collaborations between the Harvard and HBS, Healthcare Alumni Association and Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, I'm uh, excited to introduce Trishan Panch, who is a primary care physician and president of the Harvard Chan School Alumni Association. He is a lecturer in health policy and management at HSPH. He co-founded and led Wellframe, which was sold to Health Edge, owned by Blackstone, in 2021, uh, late last year, and served on the board since its inception. Trishan, over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Boris. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us wherever you, in the world you'll be. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty mind blowing, actually. There's 700 of you that have signed up to this um, uh, across the world. And then also, um, you know, this is open invite. So there's people who have signed up who aren't alum. Um, I guess what we have to say to those of you is uh, welcome and maybe we need to have a discussion about your choice of education as well but anyway no sorry of course i'm joking there but it's um uh we're uh this is a really really interesting field and it's incredibly broad i think just to set it up i just want to give you a few thoughts so the first thing is you know we are here under you know within the envelope of the uh, respective visions of uh Srikant Dutta, the uh, dean of Harvard business school and michelle williams the Dean of the School of Public Health. And both of them have stated the importance of uh, design and user-centric thinking and data science within all aspects of business. And um, on the public health side, the, these five frontiers of public health, massive structural issues such as climate change, aging, um, healthy nutrition and chronic disease management, addressing the effects of structural violence that have come to prominence, and one that you might be aware of as a risk, pandemics. Um, now, there's no reason that any of these issues are arbitrarily medical issues or public health issues or just business issues. Of course, they're issues that affect all of, all of us, and that's what makes them so interesting. And they require not just the problems being understood, but solutions being developed, organizations being developed to scale those solutions, um, uh, and all of that being done rigorously and in a sustainable manner that ensures a fair distribution of things. So there's a lot of, um, there's, is a very fertile ground, this intersection of public health and business. And also this huge mega trend in terms of the development of machine learning technologies that we're gonna go into. Um, and we believe that there is a common focus of the schools, of the broader community that's represented here, all of you, uh, in making sure we can get what works in healthcare to the greatest number of people and ensure a fair and sustainable distribution of those gains. That brings us all together. And we're gonna discuss one technology that is 
uh, rapidly growing, um, emerging, well, in, I think you could argue it's emerged um, technology in this area of machine learning and AI. And just before we go into that discussion, I just have a few kind of set up things in addition to the ground rules that uh, Boris um, identified there. Um, so the first, of course, is that we appreciate that this is a huge field and the people represented here, and you're going to hear from them in person about the way they're doing, go across the whole spectrum. But each one of the people that are, um, are represented here is, uh, um, uh, are uh, storied and recognised leaders in this field, and their field of expertise itself is huge. And we could have an entire week or month of events just in each one of those areas. So, but we're not going to do that. We're going to give them a few minutes and ask. And so there's, it's going to pose a lot of questions um, as well as hopefully answer some for you. Um, uh, and that's intentional. Um, um, the second thing is that there's a ton of, there is some technical foundation that would make this material uh, more interesting and would challenge more. And unfortunately, we're not going to have the time to go into those things on this call, which we apologize for, but practically speaking, there was no real way of achieving that, except to say we can point you in the direction um, either um, at the end or in the follow-up that we'll be um, uh, sharing with everyone who's registered on resources that you can look into to, to find out more. And the last one in, in terms of caveats or considerations before we go um, straight into it is that we also accept these very early innings. These, whatever you hear kind of in the hype machine, um, we are much closer to the start than we are to like uh, Terminator or benevolent robots taking over all of our, all of our jobs and making kind of humankind redundant. Um, and there is a ton of work in R&D, there's a ton of work in, in basic science R&D and business models in technology infrastructure. Um, and we're right in the middle of all of that now, which makes it so interesting. Um, uh, but we accept when we're, we're going to refrain on this panel from talking about the challenges as well as the opportunities, and we're not going to overplay how mature um, these technologies are, but give you a sense of hope and belief that this is a really foundational set of trends and all of you, whichever aspects of healthcare or business you're working at the moment, there's something, some, some way that you can contribute here in um, healthcare AI. So um, I'd just like to kind of uh, open the panel up. We're going to go through a few questions and then uh, we'll have some time for you guys to post some questions as well. When it does come to posing of those questions, if you could basically turn your camera on and ask the questions yourself and we'll call you from uh, the questions that are put forward in Zoom. Um, cool, okay. So the first one, and Ben, if you don't mind, I'll, um, I'll start with you, um, is if you could just um, share with our 700 new friends, um, uh, uh, um, what it is that you're working on? Um, and also, um, if there was kind of, you know, what your path into healthcare AI was, and if there was a particular uh, light bulb moment that you'd uh, be willing to share. And I, I, I believe you have a slide as well, right? That's right. Yeah. Well, right. Thank, thank you, Tristan. And, and thanks right. everyone for, uh, for being here. Um, so I'm Ben Zeskin, um, uh, educational background. I did a, um, a PhD at MIT in bioengineering and then a, an MBA at, at HPS. So hello to all my uh, fellow alum who are, who are tuned in. Um, and, you know, right after graduating from HPS, I started uh, immuneering, uh, which uh, has has uh, grown and had quite a journey and is now a um, a publicly traded company. So one of the fun parts about uh, being the CEO of a publicly traded company is that my lawyer makes me show a slide like this um, before speaking publicly. Uh, so I'll just remind you all that I'll be making forward-looking statements today. So please see our uh, public disclosures for more information. Um, now that we've gotten that out of the way, um, you know, just just to kind of give you a little uh, a bit about. Uh, my background, I'm very, I won't read the whole slide, but you know, the company is really uh, 13 years old and our goal was, was always to use computation to figure out what was happening in patients who are responding well to cancer therapy um, so that we could make that happen in more people um, so that we could achieve broad activity. And we really took a, a translational bioinformatics approach uh, where we analyzed transcriptomic and genomic data um, and, and really built the company by partnering with pharma where we had the the opportunity to work on many great medicines, including ibrutinib, ipilimumab, uh, daratumumab, and others. Um, and as we did that, we, we built a platform. Um, and, and really one of the nice things about having grown the company this way is that every uh, project that we worked on had a, a, you know, a, a pharma statistician and an experimentalist who really encouraged us to uh, generate results that you know, passed 
statistical muster and could be experimentally validated. And that was really the crucible uh, in which our platform grew. Um, you know, the, the platform has several components that let us do novel biology, novel chemistry, and translational planning. And, um, you know, particularly AI has been quite relevant to us on the novel chemistry side, um, where we have an AI-based uh, drug screening technology that we develop. So I'll, um, I'll talk more about that as it makes sense for the panel. Um, but ultimately, you know, all of this computational work enabled us to develop a, a lead product candidate in IMM1104 that we're really excited about. Um, it's for uh, RAS and RAF mutant solid tumors, which are, uh, you know, some of the most common mutations among solid tumors. And the thing that's so unique about our uh, product candidate relative to others is in the in the animal data that we see, um, we have very broad activity that, that that's really independent of what particular mutation is driving driving the tumor. Um, so that's exciting. And it, it's really the computation uh, and the platform that enabled us to get these kind of counterintuitive insights uh, that, that ultimately led to uh, uh, to 104. And, and we have a we have a broader pipeline behind that, but I'll uh, I'll pause here. I think that's a that's a sufficient uh, introduction. Thank you so much, Ben. Yeah, very much look forward to diving into that. Um, okay, cool. Um, next up, uh, Heather, Heather Matty. Thanks, Trishan. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Heather Maddy. Uh, I am a lecturer on biostatistics in the biostatistics department at the Harvard Chan School. I'm also the co-director of the Health Data Science Master's Program that we launched in 2017 um, at the school inside of the Department of Biostatistics. Um, I got my PhD in biostatistics from the Harvard Chan School, so I've been here a while. Um, I do a lot of research in uh, kind of the intersection of uh, network science, data science, and health disparities research. Um, algorithmic bias is a huge part of my research now. Um, and I teach anywhere between four to five data science and biostatistics courses a year, um, mainly aimed at the health data science master's students, but also clinicians looking to get a little bit of a foundation in data science and coding. Um, in terms of my light bulb moment, I don't think there was a moment. I think it's been at least two or three years in the making uh, where um, during my dissertation research in network science, I learned about machine learning and utilized machine learning in that. And then I got to work with clinicians like Leo and Trishan on the call um, and realized that somebody with a very technical background had to learn how to communicate with those without a technical background. Um, and so communication between the two and bridging kind of that gap and working together um, really sparked my interest in kind of clinical AI and AI in healthcare. Um, and then seeing the inequities that were perpetuated by machine learning in healthcare really made me kind of focus on algorithmic bias and fairness. Um, I think that's I think that's it. That's wonderful, Heather. Um, I think you can all well hopefully we'll you know we'll have time to reflect on the end. There's some general themes kind of coming out here from already from what uh, Ben and Heather have said, and we're going to re revisit those during the conversation. But let, uh, let's go forward. So. Javier, Javier Todable from Google, welcome. Hi everyone, uh, and thank you for inviting me in Trishan. So my name is Javier Todable. I am a technical director at Google. We are, uh, uh, I'm part of the uh, city office in Google Cloud. We're a small team of senior technologists and former CTOs uh, that reports directly to uh, Thomas Kurian, uh, who's the CEO of Google Cloud. And our mission is to support strategic partners and customers. So I meet with executives to understand uh, their technology and organizational goals, uh, listen to feedback uh, about our product, and then share a little bit about our strategy uh, and especially find opportunities to collaborate and co-innovate. I've been uh, involved in um, healthcare and in particular in AI for healthcare for about two years. Um, I think the light bulb moment for me was uh, the original announcement of uh, AlphaFold in the sense that it showed how a purely technical, uh, you know, progress or development, you know, coming from the world of AI could make a difference uh, within within uh, healthcare and life sciences, um, you know, coming from people who had, you know, very similar backgrounds uh, to me, you know, from the software engineering side of the world, instead of, you know, clinicians or, or, or people that had a long history in pharma. 
And previously, I was uh, working in uh, media entertainment, and before that, I spent uh, another 10 years, uh, 14 years total at Google, you know, building all sorts of systems, you know, uh, mostly you know, on the big data and, and AI for, for a wide variety of teams. Cool. Thanks, Javier. Welcome, of course. Yeah, I very much look forward to the discussion. Uh, okay, so last but uh, never least, um, good friend and collaborator, Leo Celli. Hi, uh, good evening, good morning, good night. <laughs> I represent uh, two big communities, actually. The first one is MIT Critical Data, and the other community is the Plus Digital Health, which is a journal that just launched this month. And there's a lot of intersection between the two communities. The goal of is Hive Learning, which is learning from each other and, and learning together. Uh, this is done across expertise, across countries, across lived experiences. Uh, our group at MIT is behind a number of publicly available data sets from electronic health records. There's MIMIC, there's EICU, uh, CRD, MIMIC checks X-ray. As regards what was my path into healthcare and AI, I think it's the realization as a practicing clinician that the medical knowledge system uh, that informs the way we deliver care is flawed in so many ways. Research is coming from a few rich countries and clearly not inclusive. And as Heather pointed out earlier, uh, the issue of health disparities, I think to a certain extent, the schools of public health and the schools, the business schools have created the problem, have perpetuated the problem. And it's time for us to own this because I don't think we can move forward unless we say that we are a part of this problem and somehow we need to change the way we're addressing uh, these issues. Excellent, cool. Okay, bit of a spicy way to finish there, Leo. I love it. It's um, okay. So, so, so I think if we um, uh, just before we kind of go into the next question, you know, I think each one of the speakers there is, um, uh, you know, exactly as we kind of said it would be at the beginning. Uh, they're in very different areas. Um, if you look at it, if you look at it technically, um, but there's some core themes I believe that apply to all of the areas that they've brought up. So Ben has brought up, um, uh, you know, the importance of enterprise partnerships um, in um, uh, in kind of getting these computational learnings into actually creating like business and organizational results and getting in front of patients. So working with the incumbents as more um, data science and machine learning fueled companies and organizations. Um, Heather's brought up um, just the necessity of multidisciplinary, and, and Ben brought this up as well, um, uh, the necessity of multidisciplinary teams in this area. And therefore, you know, exactly what that describes people from very different backgrounds, talking very different languages, learning to work together to make these technologies work because it needs that entire spectrum um, of skills, uh, which is why in the public health community, we believe these are public health issues, of course. Um, and Javier uh, talked about um, uh, essentially productizing the future. And I think also implied I think it's a very important constituency here, um, the huge academic and open source contributions of the large tech companies in the development of this field. Um, uh, uh, but also how one of those things, you know, there are foundational advances that we're all kind of standing on top of at the moment. And the whole kind of machine learning movement goes back to the, well, it goes back a long way, but this kind of era of it with the start of um, uh, uh, of deep learning and image recognition, and then most recently, foundationally, with what Javier described as AlphaFold, which we'll go into a little bit more with, um, with Ben also. And then Leo, lastly, in terms of actually realizing these gains at the bedside, how early we are, um, and the importance of even once that's done, given the fragility of these approaches, uh, how open data and open data collaborations are gonna be a core part of um, getting these getting these technologies to scale. So. Um, with that in mind, I think this sets up kind of our next question well, uh, obviously not by coincidence, which is that, um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of reasons to be hopeful um, in, this, uh, um, in this field. And there's also, you know, re realistically huge concerns around the actual real clinical results delivered at the bedside um, outside of studies um, uh, or, 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 you know, in, re in the research capacity, in the clinical capacity versus research capacity, uh, but then also concerns regarding privacy and bias and sustainability that um, Heather and, and Leo brought up earlier. So um, I guess I would like to, again, uh, start with uh, Ben, if you don't mind, you know, what um, excites you most 
about this field in 2022. And if you have any, you know, either from uh, specifically at engineering or more generally in the field of drug discovery, um, uh, any, if you would hazard to kind of look into your crystal ball and tell us a little bit about, you know, what, uh, any predictions of where you see this area going over the next couple of years. Sure, happy to. Um, and, and look, you know, I think one of the things that that's most fundamentally exciting about, you know, AI broadly defined in, in, in healthcare um, is really the ability to provide counterintuitive results uh, that are rooted in data, you know, something that you that you kind of wouldn't have thought of. Um, and for us in, you know, in the area that we work in, which is developing uh, cancer medicines, that's that's really important because, you know, for all the medical progress that there's been, you know, it's still the case that millions of people die of cancer every year. Mm -hmm. And if we keep doing the intuitive thing, we're going to keep getting the same results. Um, so that's why, you know, counterintuitive insights are so important, but, uh, you know, you can't just sort of come up with random ideas willy nilly, right? They need to be rooted in data. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's the, that's kind of the, the beauty of AI and, and, and computation more generally in the, the space that I'm in. And that's, you, you know, that's what uh, excites us so much is 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 the idea that you can come up with a with a very counterintuitive insight, whether it's um, you know in our case the uh, you know the, the biological mechanisms um, that underlie our lead program, uh, which is sort of a you know a different way to target cancer cells while sparing healthy cells, uh, you know whether it's the the novel chemistry that we've come up with uh, you know using our AI platform for some of the some of the earlier stage programs. But in each case, it was, you know, it, it was something counterintuitive um, yeah. that sort of we wouldn't have come up with by the traditional methods, but that, you know, ultimately proved robust because it was it was rooted in data. And, and I think that sort of ultimately proving robust is critical because, it you know, at the end of the day, you have to take these predictions and validate them in the real world. In our case, validate them experimentally. And, and the, you know, the more rooted in data the predictions are, the more likely they are to, to, to validate experimentally. So that, you know, for me at a high level, that's, that's what's so exciting about this field is just, just the ability to generate counterintuitive insights that can, can really help to change uh, uh, the status quo. And, and I think, Ben, I mean, it's a very, very important point that you're bringing up, which is that, I mean, of course, that's the scientific method, right? You know, that's, uh, and essentially we have a new set of tools in the toolbox around the scientific method. Super, super exciting. Um, okay, Heather. So, if if you wouldn't mind if I, I moved on to you, and I'll ask you essentially a, a, a spin on on the question, if you don't mind. Um, so, it's that you know, so the 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 folks that are doing this work that Ben is um, hiring within engineering, you are training those folks. And like, I think you know, you introduced what you're doing bef before, but I think we should kind of make even more of a point on it. It was the first uh, dedicated health data science master's program in a in a school of public health anywhere. Uh, and um, so I guess, you know, in, in, uh, from that point of view, uh, uh, in terms of training the, the current generation and the next generation of data scientists who are doing um, this kind of work using these tools within the spectrum of organizations represented here and otherwise. Yeah, what is it that most excites you about AI, either from, either from a technical point of view or from a consideration of some of these uh, much broader structural issues regarding bias and in inclusion in, in the field? Yeah, so I'll, I'm excited about a few things, but what I'm, I think, most excited for is more work in defining, detecting, and mitigating algorithmic bias and making algorithms more fair. Um, I'm, I also love that we have kind of, from our health data science program, more have sprung up around all over the country um, in schools of public health, but also other institutions. Um, and so we're kind of building this new uh, kind of workforce that hopefully can communicate with clinicians and healthcare professional, healthcare professionals in a really uh, cohesive way so that these AI um, breakthroughs that we have, if we can get them into, um, you know, use um, at the bedside, they are going to be a seamlessly kind of seamlessly worked into the workflow there. And hopefully, my hope, uh, the next couple of years or so, is to figure out how to kind of alleviate clinician fatigue, get them away from the screen by having AI kind of um, look at the data, a lot of data for them, so they don't have to sit to sift through it themselves and kind of you know 
kind of organize all of that for them so they can spend more time with the uh, with the patient and less with um, you know yeah. interacting with the screen and things. Oh, man. Excellent. Good stuff. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, um, Javier, um, I guess you know the same question. So um, I guess maybe let's just kind of um, start back where your last answer finished actually if you, um, if you don't mind like so if we start with like um, alpha fold, um, these kind of core R and D investments, productizing them, getting some of these things to scale. Yeah, what are the things that most excite you in in those areas? Well, there's there's a long list of of technical achievements and where we see the field progressing. That I think really really interesting. But I, I want to focus on one specific idea. Okay. You know, in, yeah. in the world of machine learning, there's always been this tension between understanding at a deep level how methods work or how systems work and and this notion that you know if a black box you know just works then it doesn't really matter exactly what it does right if you have a machine learning model that can find the perfect you know uh, drug for a specific patient what does it matter that you don't really understand how it works and and that has been a problem traditionally i think for the application of ai in healthcare because you know doctors and scientists, they want to understand how things work, right? You know, it's really hard to rely on a system that, that is going to have an impact on, on somebody's life. Um, and I think one of the things that, that happened uh, with AlphaFold was not just the, the technical achievement of being able to predict protein folding, but also this acceptance that if we had a system that, that works and works just as well as, uh, you know, experimental uh, methods, then we can use it and, and it's okay to use, you know, these kinds of systems. So I think we're going to see, you know, a, a, you know, a, a broad uh, usage of machine learning in, in scientific problems, uh, even in cases in which we don't have 100% understanding of how these methods work. Right. So I think that's that's a very controversial idea. Right. But at some point we may be, uh, you know, using, you know, critical decision support systems, for example, that, you know, they're not based on rules. Right. They're based on machine learning methods for which, you know, we may not understand exactly how they work, but they may work, you know, significantly better than, than a human. They make less mistakes. They may not get tired and so on and so forth. So I think that that okay. mind shift is really interesting. Cool. Excellent. Thank you so much. I mean, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, uh, it, Leo, um, I've got a, a, a number of thoughts here, but I'd like to hear yours uh, first. And I think let's go into a bit of a discussion on this area. So, okay, so so uh, just 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 to kind of set it up, I mean, Javier has brought up that yeah, I mean, these um, machine learning models of black boxes, not uh, in terms of it's impossible to see what's going on in, inside, which I guess is what the what the metaphor suggests. It's more that it's it's in perfectly transparent, but it's in incredibly complex, so it's kind of not human intelligible. So, how does like some input into the model create the output yes that's perfectly described but it's not intelligible which that may be acceptable um, in some situations and it may not be acceptable in others and i guess Leo, what i'd like to ask you is uh, the areas where it's where there's a higher level of proof required i.e where we, we know these approaches are probabilistic so therefore they can fail and where there's a human cost to that i.e like what are the challenges of applying machine learning methods in clinical medicine? Um, and yeah, I'd love to know kind of what your what your thoughts are in that area. Yeah, be before I answer that question, I, I prepared some uh, responses oh, there to we the go. earlier questions. Cool. And well. it's, it's uh, expanding on what Heather uh, mentioned yeah. as what's most exciting about AI in healthcare in 2022, that this is happening at a time and there is heightened awareness of diversity, equity, and inclusion. If this happened even a decade ago, I am certain that we would have failed, which brings me to the question about predictions for 2022 and 2023. I hate to be the doomsayer in the group, but I think that we will not make any significant advances in AI in healthcare for a number of reasons. Uh, the first is the use of real world data to develop and validate algorithms. As you know, real world data is rife with disparities. And if we're using accuracy to assess them, then there is no hope for us to address uh, these disparities. And then the other reason is that those who build algorithms, that's us, do not represent the perspectives of those who are most vulnerable. Uh, we cannot chart the course of healthcare with the same mental models that created the problems in the first place. Uh, and then moving on to your question about explainability, 
to me, the most important uh, aspect of explainability is not ma is making sure that the algorithms are making decisions not based on sensitive attributes such as race, ethnicity, or gender, or other demographics. I don't need to know exactly how those decisions are made. More than half of the medications that I prescribe, we have no clue how they work, but we still prescribe them because they work. But from an algorithm, what I need to know is that those features that are not relevant to the prediction or classification are not being used in the same way that humans do. And I, I would like to mention it again, the real world data that we're using uh, is full of subjectivity on the part of the providers. And if we're gonna predict the outcome and base that on the ground truth, then we're gonna continue to have poorer outcomes in the most vulnerable population. And I think this is the reason why we're not gonna make significant headway, but maybe we're gonna pivot in 2022 and 2023 on how we're building and assessing algorithms, but no major movements in terms of improvement in population health. Uh, okay, so so I was gonna, that's what my follow-up question was gonna be actually. I think we should qualify these statements a little bit. I can, I, 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 I understand where you're coming from. I think I just wanna make sure that everyone else does as well. So what you're saying is not that there won't be like scientific advances or the field won't move forward. I think what you're, or that actually there'll be that uh, you, you know I, I guess I'm asking you is it um, is it that you're saying that like the 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 impact that you have in mind is about addressing health inequalities or inequities and um, that there won't be any significant movement in the short term uh, um, in terms of AI improving those disparities because essentially it's going into a system that's structurally biased being trained on data that is created by that system and broader society and being developed by the people who are currently administering the current setup. Is that roughly what you're, what you're saying? Yes, like the purpose of scientific advancement is to improve population health. And the, the most, uh, the, the, the cohort of the people who, who carry the, the biggest burden of disease, I don't think it's gonna have, uh, it's gonna be impacted by AI. And for that reason, the scientific advancements are, irrelevant, are useless. In the short run, right? So like, I guess, so my question to you would be, okay, what about five years out or 10 years out? I mean, if we were talking about cancer because of the advancements in drugs in the 1990s, there's a lot of optimism too. But we could say that there are advances in cancer in rich countries. There, there's minimal advances in cancer in most of the world. And can we say that there has been a success? Mm. I would disagree. Um, so to me, the purpose of all this healthcare technology is to, as I said, improve everyone's health, not the health of a few, uh, a, a, a small segment of the population. Okay. All right. So, so I mean, I mean this is very much from the macroscopic like global point of view and very much thinking through a long term okay understood um so as we see folks there's like there's a there's a large spectrum of opportunities and a large spectrum of challenges here um uh and i think you know our our intention is to kind of give you a flavor of what these issues are um and i think all of you out there will have some opinions on which side of this debate you want to go on and that's totally fine it's um i think all of these are uh, all of it, 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 it takes everyone. Um, and I think, you know, as we kind of go back to what we said before, the reason we believe um, uh, that there's a common focus here is that we're all trying to focus on that long range goal that Leia has in mind, and there's different methods towards getting there. And it's a really hard problem to solve. And it's not a problem that's, I think one of the key issues here that I would like to kind of throw into the mix is that this isn't a specific issue of machine learning. Like that setup that Leo just bought, you could apply to literally any health technology um, and kind of um, economic systems more broadly. So these are large scale, persistent structural issues in human societies. And um, we should realize that and qualify thinking about machine learning. This is not, these aren't uniquely machine learning problems, but 
they are problems that we should be cognizant of when we're developing any new technology, um, such as um, such as machine learning. So, um, okay, I was just I thought I'd give the rest of you uh, if you had any kind of follow up to what um, Leo was saying. Uh, we have a few minutes, um, or if not, I might just go forward to the next question because I think this could be an interesting one to kind of engage the broader audience around. So, if anyone's got something like burning they want to say now, then please kind of let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll call on you or if not, we'll move on to Javier, please. Yeah, just to follow up on that, maybe yeah. from a slightly different perspective. I, I think there is a, this is a real problem as well from the perspective of a technology provider, right? You know, for for a while, you know, you know, some of us have been trying to democratize, you know, AI and, and make it, you know, available. I think, uh, you know, I completely agree that this is going to be a, a problem, right? Like you, we have a situation where a few, you know, technology companies or well-funded institutions have access to this type of technology and can spend the, the budgets and the compute power and, and have the budgets to hire the people that can do these kinds of things, whereas the technology is just not available to, uh, to uh, most players, right? And I don't have a solution for it, <laughs> but, but I, I think, you know, this is also a problem from, you know, from, from the perspective of, you know, big tech. Yep, got it. Um, it's, sorry, I'm just being given a time warning. That's why I was just, I was, I was just um, a, a, a little bit distracted there. Okay, so, so so let's go into that. I hope there'll be some interesting questions from the audience, and I can I can curate them um, and ask them. But before we get there, we have just got a few minutes left. So I think what I would um, uh, just you know something to leave the broader audience with. What is it that you know now? Um, having you know kind of been in the um, in the trenches, so to speak, with this set of problems and seeing this um, field hugely blossom uh, uh, as well uh, that you wish you'd known back when you started um, or that you didn't know that when you were started um, and maybe someone who's new and coming into this field it wouldn't necessarily be obvious just from the things that they hear in the media and read um, um, so yeah what is it that you've learned about healthcare AI that you wish you'd known when you uh, started off on this journey um, so maybe we'll start off um, Javier, with you? I, I would say for me, you know, I wish I had known or understood how hard it is to drive organizational changes. Wow. You know, I, I, you know, like, you know, I guess like you, Trishan, right? I, I see the technology and, and, and I think, well, this is a problem that can be solved with computers, right? But, uh, but then you try to apply these kinds of things in real life and it takes forever and, and people are not excited about change and it's very hard to you know, modify systems and to adapt incentives. So I wish I had known how hard it was to, to drive yeah. change. And, and I mean, and, and is it fair to say like, especially in healthcare, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's difficult mm -hmm. in the industry, but yeah. yeah. Okay. For sure. I mean, like healthcare must be the only industry where people still use faxes. <laughs> Yeah, that's always the that's 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 the iconic example of of, of poor technical progress. Uh, okay, understood. Um, uh, ben. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, one of the one of the important things to you know that I really kind of appreciate is is you know just um, how much hype there is out there right now about about uh, AI, um, and and to really just you know separate that. Um, from the reality on the ground, which is, you know, there are some very interesting and important advances, but, it, you know, I, I think, you know, people need to under, understand the difference. And look, artificial intelligence is not a new concept. You know, 20 years ago, as, a, as an undergrad at MIT, I took an artificial intelligence class. My, uh, my lab partner joked that, uh, that I was the artificial, she was the intelligence. Um, but, uh, you know, it, just to show you that it's, this has been around for a long time, and it, it wasn't a new field. Uh, 20 years ago either so and to be sure there have been some incredible advances driven by computing power you know image processing and 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 the like but it you know I, I think you know part of why there's such a focus on this is because of the progress but but part of it is also just just kind of the the hype uh you know that's been generated and you know we all you know there's there's um there's different reasons for that and and you know there's i, I think there's been certain companies that have let the hype get get way 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 ahead of the reality and you know i won't i won't name names but it, um you know i think that's why it's it's really important to, to to ground the outcomes of ai in 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 truth um and and you know in in the field that i work in you know the truth is in the experiments right the truth is in if you, if you can make a prediction and then go test it experimentally 
um, and, and, and see that it works. So, yeah. you know, I, I think that um, there, there's such incredible promise for AI and, and, and computation. And, and I think the, you know, the people that, that sort of take the hype too far, they do it a disservice because then, you know, people start thinking, you know, humans are going to be replaced and, and all of these things. And, um, you know, reality is it's, you know, it's very useful in, in certain situations, but, you, you know, I, I just, I think that's to, to really appreciate the true areas where it can be helpful. I, I think it's yeah. important to um, distinguish between that and, and kind of the, yeah. the, the hype that gets, gets out of control sometimes. Yeah, it's a very important point, right? Like, I mean, I guess the kind of obvious counter is that, um, yes, but then also like we have utterly superhuman things being achieved, right? You know, we've got, we've got generative speech from machines that humans, most of us can't distinguish. Uh, we have superhuman performance in certain diagnostic tasks in protein folding, this like core scientific challenge in, in, in game playing. And I think there probably also is some value of like, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, uh painting the impossible uh future you know as a way of like it's inspiring people to move directionally there but then exactly as you say like it kind of makes it seem like well that's an inevitability but there's a ton of technical challenges and realities to get there and, and, and i think if people portray that exciting future as an exciting future then it's yeah. it's totally fine and it's a good way to sort of show society direction but it you know it's it, when people portray something as, as being here now, uh, you know, that's not, that's not really here now. I, you know, I, I think that's where, um, yeah. you know, it, it starts to get a little bit uh, uh, confusing for people, but yeah, I mean, certainly there, there have been advances, you know, I, I think, you know, again, just, just bringing it back to the field that I work on, you know, I, I don't think there've been such dramatic uh, uh, contributions yet from AI, right. Cause you know, for us, the North star is always, the patients right and you yeah. know millions of people are still dying of cancer so yeah. you know there's still a lot that needs to be done um but uh you know i think there have been as you say really exciting uh, uh progress uh, from ai in a number of fields so as long as people portray that accurately i think it's it's all to the good excellent thank you sir um okay uh next up heather I was thinking the same thing, how difficult it is to actually implement anything that we come up with. Um, I'm coming, I've dipped my toes into the industry field with nutrition and well-frame, but um, I'm mostly coming from the academia standpoint where we get research grants and we work on these, what we think are amazing algorithms or breakthroughs in machine learning, and then we can't implement them or, you know, it takes years to even try to get it to a stage where it can be implemented. There's exceptions to that role. Dana Farber is actually really good at that because they're kind of all in-house. But um, yeah, I, I did not know how difficult it would be <laughs> going into this um, to do that. And then I also think, and I'll be a broken record because it's what I'm most passionate about, but how um, impactful algorithms can be if they are um, you know, biased and and used yeah. and, and implemented when they shouldn't be, um, how how detrimental that can be. I, I didn't think about it uh, when I jumped in. Yeah. So that's interesting, right? So like a technical training. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Cool. OK, Heather, well, we actually have some questions from the audience around this. So I'll, I'll, I'll go to Leo and then I'll come back um, to that if you don't mind. Um, uh, so Leo, um, yeah, um, uh, over to you. I guess actually, if you wouldn't mind in your answer, Leo, just, um, I don't, you know, I, I think one of the things in the, uh, broadly that people don't understand, uh, that I think people understand very well on, on the technical side of the community is just the amazing contribution of Mimic and what that is and the scale of it and what it's uh, started. So if you wouldn't mind, I know you're kind of uh, probably, you know, too humble to go into this directly yourself, but just if you could also talk about uh, that open data movement and some of the impacts um, of that in um, developing machine learning capacity around the world. Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned, um, uh, we have been in the business of uh, making available uh, electronic health record data sets. And we were hoping that by, the, by, by 2022, that there will be more of us uh, who are in this business, but unfortunately that hasn't happened. But 
I'm optimistic that we're heading that way with new initiatives from the NIH, new requirements from funding organizations that we will not give you money unless you share your data set and that this is going to become a resource for the research community and not just focus on some vertical clinical question. Uh, but I, I wanted to answer your question of what did I not uh, appreciate when I started this? And I think that is uh, what we refer to as digital determinants of health, which is kind of different from social determinants of health. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is a very important topic for, for this group. So I wanted to expand a little bit. And there are really three categories of digital determinants of health. The first one pertain to, pertains to digital health tools that leave behind certain populations. So those without adequate connectivity, those with cognitive dysfunction, such as uh, those with dementia or developmentally delayed, those with other disabilities, those with mental health issues, those with behavioral disorders, the hearing impaired, the visually impaired, especially with telehealth becoming uh, a norm and standard now. And then the second category pertains to digital health tools that were designed around the white population, such as those that leverage infrared technology. So we've heard about pulse oximetries uh, that seem to be not as accurate in the non-white individuals or technology that doesn't work for those who do not have a normal habitus. So, so sensors don't really work for the morbidly obese individuals. And how many diagnoses are we going to be missing because the ECGs are not capturing the electrical uh, uh, activity of the heart for those who are morbidly obese. And finally, the third category of digital uh, determinants of health is coming from the AI community, algorithms that perpetuate or magnify health disparities because they were trained on real world data. So I, I wish that I had known this earlier, I wouldn't have wasted, well, I, I wasn't wasting a lot of time in just understanding the technology, but having that mindset from the very beginning would really have helped me to make uh, research more efficient and more effective. Interesting, okay. Um, all right, so we have a number of questions uh, and they're great questions. Um, uh, I think I'm, I'm just going to have to pick a few out, um, I'm, I'm afraid. So to those that I don't pick out, um, uh, I apologize um, in advance, but I'm going to pick the ones that I think are kind of broadly go across what the different uh, uh, people can talk about. So um, but I'd like to thank you all for your questions. And, um, you know, I think as you can see here, just by the spectrum of questions, if you want to have a look, there's uh, a lot we could go into further with this and we want to do a series of these, a series of these events and we would invite you and um, hope that you can join us uh, for that. Um, okay, so um, uh, uh, the first one that I'd like to go into, sorry, I just I lost the thread of where it's at, um, is a question from Lawrence. And this is around the bias issue, around the black box issue, those kind of things. So um, explainability, excuse me. So um, how do you determine if a counterintuitive finding is a reflection of reality and not a result of algorithmic or other biases. Such biases, their magnitude and the impact may differ between, for example, use of an uh, AI approach in protein folding or image analysis, compared, for example, in use of real world data from electronic health records and other health records. Um, so, um, uh, so, so an algorithm that is trained on data from the real world that produces a result that one doesn't expect. Is that result an insight? Is that result uh, a, a poor technical performance? Is it algorithmic bias? Um, that's a very interesting conceptual question there. Um, I guess maybe, Heather, would you mind if I start with you? I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but we can share it around as well. I was hoping you wouldn't. I thought Ben would start. <laughs> um, yeah, you would. Never. I'll go next. Uh, <laughs> Oh man, this is yeah. It, 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 it's, it's a hard question. So Lawrence, we want to thank you for the question. It's, it's a hard one. It doesn't have a perfect answer, but it is a very important structural question. Yeah, I, I. So I don't have a straightforward answer for this. Um, I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head. Okay. But you know, if you if your data is biased and you're putting it into the model, it's going to create biased outcomes usually. I know Leo's going to have more to say about this. He's raising his hand. Um, so separating, if you're using real world data, that is already biased. You're just going to kind of usually perpetuate that through the model and then have biased outcomes. So I think that will be algorithmic bias. Uh, is it a real insight 
probably, um, you know, I go back to kind of the judicial system data set um, about, uh, you know, yeah. parole and, and everything and, and, and uh, sentence lengths and racist uh, data yeah. led to racist kind of outcomes. And so um, it does reflect the world that it's being, that's being used to train it. So there's a more eloquent way to say that. With no, 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 cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so, so if you wouldn't mind in the, in, in the order of these things, uh, Ben, um, I suspect you've got some thoughts. Would you mind if I called on you next? Sure, sure. Yeah. And I'll just answer it quickly and, and then we can go to, 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 to Leo. But, um, you, you know, because I, I did mention counterintuitive in my introduction and, and, and thanks, Lauren, Lawrence, for the question. Um, you know, look, at the, at the molecular level, it's easy, right? So, the, you know, the kind of counterintuitive findings we talk about are, are sort of the, the mechanisms of how, uh, you know, cancer cells are working relative to, to healthy cells. Um, and so, the, you know, the, the beauty of that is you can test it experimentally very easily. And that's, um, you know, that's a very quick way to, uh, to get it at, at ground truth uh, in the, you know, the, you know, and evaluate the counterintuitive findings that we, we talk about in our, in our work to develop uh, medicines. Uh, you know, obviously, it's, it's a much more complex issue for the kind of population data that, uh, that Heather and Leo uh, uh, focus on. So maybe I'll, I can hand it over. That's, uh, that, that's a fantastic. So, so Ben, main critical point here is that um, uh, in kind of society, in the, so if you look at health outcomes, they're incredibly causally dense. And some of those things are like biological or, or, or biochemical. Some of those things are social factors. Some of them are environment. Some of them are effectively roll of the dice chance, you know, things that pandemics come up or you have earthquakes or these kind of things. Um, so then figuring out whether an inference is the result of biased data or it's picked up on other things in the distribution of possible events that we're not seeing is a really hard problem. And like in uh, biology, according to our mechanistic understanding of it, you have some ground truth that you can compare against and use the scientific method, but it's very hard in uh, population, medicine or population health. Yeah, that's a very important point. Okay, cool. Um, uh, Leo, then Javier, if you don't mind. So um, Leo. Yeah, no, I, I, but my, my term for this uh, counterintuitive findings is actually spurious associations. Okay. And spurious Good. associations are almost always a result of sampling selection bias. And I'm going to plead to those people who are creating and validating algorithms out there that before you even do any exploratory data analysis, you need to figure out how people got into your data sets. So when, before you even go into mimic, you need to find out, are there people who don't even reach the ICU because yeah. they die at home? Are there people who are system, systematically excluded from being admitted to the ICU for so many reasons? And you need to know the baseline disparities. So don't just go in there and start dumping all the covariates into some autoencoder and, and, and transformer. You need to understand where are the disparities and what are the drivers of disparity? So knowing that this disparities exist is not enough. You need to tease out what are the, uh, the factors that contribute to the disparities. Is it access to healthcare? Is it subjectivity on the part of the providers? Or is it something else? Is it a technology that was designed around the white individual? So maybe the bias is because it's not picking up the right oxygen saturation of a patient of color. So having this, understanding before you even do any histograms, I think is required. You have to do your due, due diligence or your homework uh, and, and not just start uh, creating the models because I think yeah. you're gonna be wasting so much time if you just dive deep into the data. Yeah, interesting, okay. So I think you've also kind of bought, um, uh, reinforced some uh, things that were brought up by Ben and Javier and Heather earlier is like, um, the importance of working in teams, uh, these multidisciplinary teams who have knowledge of the clinical process, um, uh, as well as like um, how to build and test the algorithms. Um, but then equally, also the importance of understanding of the context and the context defined really broadly. I mean, you don't hear people who typically talk about open data talking about the kind of things that you're talking about. Well, certainly not in my experience, but it's um, so that's a very critical point. So the kind of 
Um, I guess, you know, you would broadly say, and this is an established idea in machine learning, right? That like, you just need to know about the data generating process. I mean, that's effectively what you're saying, but in this case, it's a very complex data generating process that isn't just technically within the hospital. It's about who's even in the hospital in the first place and how the hospital operates, um, which is a very important point. Thank you. Um, Javier? Um, um, yeah, I would say just a couple of ideas. I think it's important to remember that a lot of these methods are probabilistic in nature, yeah. right? So if something is 99% accurate, it means that in 1% of the cases, it yeah. fails, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, nothing, you know, you know, related to machine learning is, is perfect, right? Um, I think the best that we can do is, you know, like Leo said, right, to make sure that the process used to build those systems uh, is is uh, is appropriate, right? That there's you know enough data with enough variety, uh, you know, for the population that that is going to affect and so on and so forth, right? And you know maybe when we read a paper about a, a an AI system that is built for a specific problem, we should read it as if it was a, a scientific paper, uh, you know, that that shows yeah. you know the the effectivity of a drug or whatever, right? And we'll read the methods section and make sure that the, the way that the data was obtained is the same way that you would you know you know select people for a clinical trial, right? Or you know or something along those lines. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very important. It's um, uh, yeah, I I. Uh... I think yeah, there's a, there's a ton in this area actually. Sorry, I won't go into it because it's just we're, we're going to go down a bit of a rabbit hole. We probably need to wrap up a little bit. So I'm going to try and get one uh, more question in from the audience. Maybe it will require a little bit more of a short form response. So I'm going to try and pick a question that lends itself to a short form response. Um, uh, okay, there's some really good questions here, but these are these are kind of not going to lend themselves to. Um, uh, okay, let's go to like the from from anonymous attendee. Um, where do you see the readiness and adoption on machine learning AI models by clinicians and clinical practices? So I think really let me let me generalize that one. So um, you know we uh, non tech uh, healthcare organizations. Um, I think we could probably put maybe uh, unfair to put large pharma in there, but we'll, let's do it for the sake of argument. Um, uh, large pharma, payers, providers, national governments, where are they in your opinion on actually kind of using these technologies as part of the mainstream of what they do? Um, so Javier, maybe in, 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 in reverse order. Uh, I would say years away in yeah, general. Uh, even, even technology that has been out there like you know, for, for a long time, it's is really hard to find, uh, you know, using voice to communicate with your, you know, with your, uh, uh, you know, health plan, right, to ask details about, uh, you know, an insurance claim, right? You know, I, I think it will, it will still take a few years until we see this industry. Yeah, yeah, understood. I mean, that's uh, close to home. That's the kind of work you and I do together there. But it's, um, uh, um, Ben? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, in pharma for, for certain specific problems, you know, I'd say it's, it's already starting to be used and, and, you know, particularly in areas where you can, uh, you know, validate the result, right, where you can run an experiment to test it. Um, you know, I, I can't, can't speak to the more of the applications in, in clinical, uh, clinical practice, but, but obviously for all the challenges we've discussed today, uh, you know, that's probably, uh, probably a little further out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much, Ben. Um, Leia? Um, I agree with, uh, with, with uh, Ben and Javier. I think as long as the people who are in the pay scale of making the decisions don't understand what the issues are, we're, we're not going to see any headway. We're not going to move the needle. They, they need to understand what are the limitations. They need to understand where the par problems are. Yeah, and actually, sorry, just just quick shameless plug uh, before they cut us off. Uh, we have a course, um, all, all of us together here, actually, Ben would love it if you could join us this year, in fact, um, uh, Applied AI for Healthcare, where we try and bridge that gap. People making, running healthcare organizations, trying to make decisions for you to be literate in what these issues are so you can make more informed ones. Heather, you have the final word. Oh boy, um, I'm I'm more of the data scientist behind the computer person, but yeah, I would absolutely agree with everyone. It's it's years away. We have to get higher level people to get on board and and really understand what's going on, and that's going to need better communication, um, better results, and better integration um, tactics. I think. Uh, 
So a ways away. I do think there's, like I mentioned before, Dana Farber is doing a really great job. I'm sure there's other places that are doing really well in this area, but I, I haven't heard yeah. from any. So. Excellent. Okay. Well, Heather, that, 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 um, that sets it up perfectly. So firstly, I'd like to thank uh, the respective alumni associations who helped us organize this, the HPS Alumni Association from whom the seed of uh, this idea um, comes from the healthcare alumni. I'd like to thank them. I'd like to thank you, our 700 new friends, wherever you might be in the world, be it in the morning, the afternoon, evening, or in the nighttime, especially those of you in the nighttime, uh, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, we would like to do subsequent events. Basically, probably, you know, what I'm going to propose is a deep dive in uh, different areas of healthcare AI, because it's incredibly broad. Each one of these panelists represents a huge field of study, and I think we could do sessions just on those. And these views from the field, get some HBS alarm, HSPH alarm, and some senior technical um, specialists. Um, uh, uh, and um, then also probably some on like emer other emerging technologies, if there's interest. So, you know, what is the metaverse? What's the relevance of it? Uh, Web3, cryptocurrency, these other technological movements that are much further behind and uh, much earlier than, than the machine learning. But without, um, uh, we've gone over time, we've overstayed our welcome. We'd like to uh, you know, on behalf of the audience, we'd like to thank you, uh, Javier, thanks Ben, thanks Leo, thanks Heather, your um, uh, wisdom was incredibly uh, well received, I've been taking notes, I'm sure lots of people in the audience have, um, and then for you all who've spared your time to sit with us, um, thanks, um, thanks for your time and thanks for taking part, that's what kind of makes these live events uh, special. Just one last thing, even though we're over, if people want to like find out about your work, uh, online or, or, or however else, where should they go? Um, um, Heather, would you mind if I start with you? You can Google Heather Maddie Harvard. <laughs> My do, faculty page will show up. Yeah. yeah, I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, uh, so that's that. Leo? That was shameless plugging of Google, uh, Heather. <laughs> I'm just going to call you out. <laughs> uh, uh, MIT Critical Data. Uh, I, I, we're trying to update our website. Excellent. And, and, and more like, I mean, yeah, I mean, Google make a hell of a lot of useful products, but like, but one of them, like Google Scholar, you can see uh, the research work, um, most of which is open access from these two as well. Um, uh, ben? Immunering.com. Excellent. Good stuff. Um, and Javier? Anything. Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, just Google my name and you'll find a way to contact me. Good stuff. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for your time. Good. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.